Uh, what this, this leadership summit is about is leadership and how that fits into the equations of, of final expense, the insurance industry, how that fits into your, your general professional life, how that fits into your personal life, uh, how you and I um, access and extract from these three days ideas and concepts and principles that's going to further uh, my approach uh, as a manager and a leader. And there's nothing more fitting than coming to a leadership conference to do that. And so what we're going to attempt, and, I, and you've got to partner with me in this, what we're going to attempt really quickly and throughout the next three days is that we're going to transform this conference room into a courtroom. Y'all with that? Ooh, fun stuff. We're going to transform the conference room into a courtroom. You say, well, why a courtroom? You know, even Mike mentioned a moment ago you, in this devotion about um, Jesus and God, and, and he gave us some great edits there. And the one thing that I know about Jesus' life on earth is that he was on trial. Are y'all with that? Arguably, and some could argue or want to argue, they fail in that argument, that he was and is the greatest leader that's ever been. Okay? And the concepts are extraordinary. And so what I thought we'd do that would be fun, uh, maybe a little adventurous, uh, even a little bit risky, is that we would put leadership on trial. How about that? Want to do it? Want to test it? Let's put leadership on trial. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to transform our thinking in the room, okay? And so in, in thinking, in our thinking, you've got to see this no longer as a conference room, okay? But you've got to go there with me and see this as a courtroom. And so I'm going to do a little bit of my best to try and rearrange some of the room. Because the idea, I think, is extraordinary. And this is not just for my period of sharing, but this is going to be for the three days, okay, in which we're going to share. All right? So that's real important. So what's going to happen here in this summit, uh, we're going to make a case for leadership over these three days. And so what we want to do is bring leadership to trial. So let's transform the room. Here's what we've got. We're going to transform the room. First of all, before we I get into the litigation, okay, uh, about leadership, we've got to get a jury. Are y'all with that? So what we're going to do, Scotty, I love where those chairs are, you're already ahead of me. I've already handpicked my jury. Are y'all with this? So you've ever been to try, you've ever had jury duty? You ever had that? Anybody's had jury duty before? You guys are experienced. Well, I've, I've had jury duty before, and you guess what? You've got to go. You've got to go. You don't have a choice. I'm sorry. Hey, man, you can say what you want. You've got to show up for jury duty, or they're going to come get you. You know? So I'm going to call some people, and we've got eight chairs over here. If I'm counting right, is that right, Kevin? Is that eight chairs? We need four more chairs. We're going to put those four chairs on this side of the room. So if you're sitting in a... Kevin? Five. How many I need? Oh, we need five chairs. We need 12 people on the jury, don't we? Okay? So we're going to look for our 12 people. Are you ready? And so I'm going to call out our jury. And remember, this is being done over the course of three days. This is not uh, closing arguments, by the way. It won't take place really until Wednesday. Are you all with that? So over the course of these three days, it's going to be very important that you listen to the case very uh, closely. Uh, yours truly uh, will be serving as defense attorney. Are y'all with that? Okay? I've, I've been schooled in the fine arts of, uh, of, of litigation at one of the premier institutions there, there is. That's our One Life uh, um, <laughs> our Academy, if you will. So, so get ready for an incredible litigation. I'm a great litigator, as you will find out along the way. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to call the jury uh, to order. Is that okay? We've got seven here, Kevin. We're going to need five more, and we're going to place that five on this side of the room. Everybody with me so far? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You ready to go to court? Yes, sir. 
let's go to court. We're going to court with leadership. You say, why in the heck they invited me to a leadership conference? Well, I'm going to tell you why in the heck we invited you to a leadership conference. So we can lead. Are y'all with that? We not only want to be leaders specifically, but we want to be the foremost leader in final expense in the world. Is, y'all, is that okay? Yes, sir. Is, is that far stretching? Is that too much to ask? Can we get there? Is that possible? I don't hear enough people saying that. Is that possible? I believe it is. I believe it is. Because I'm from the old school that says this. If you think you dare not, you don't. If you like to win and think you can't, it's almost a sense you won't. If you think you're lost and you're lost, for out in the world you'll find that success begins with the person's will. It's all in their state of mind. If you think you're outclassed, then you are. You have to think how to rise before you can ever win a prize. That life successes don't always go to the most obvious man or woman. But sooner or later, the one who wins is the one who thinks he can. You see, that's where it starts. That's where it is. It's an unbelievable, unyielding conviction and belief that we can do greater things than we've ever done. We can go places that we've never been. We can achieve things we've never achieved. We can break records that's never been broken. And until we begin to think that way, because great leaders think like that, they get out of the bed thinking that way. They go to sleep thinking that way. When they're eating, they think that way. That's how they think. So here we are, we're in court. And so I'm going to call you to jury duty. Can I get Eric up, please? Eric, you've been summoned to court. Please take your seat. Benji Crooms, you've been summoned to court. Benji, take your jury seat. If you don't have that, the seats are all taken. You'll bring yours. We're bringing those chairs now. And actually, because we will be coming through those doors, so we'll have the others on that side. That's excellent. Mike Jr., you've been called to jury duty. Dan Rose, you've been called to jury duty. Richard Reyes, you've been called to jury duty. Did I say it correctly? Lamar, where's Lamar? Skipper, you've been called to jury duty. KT, you've been called to jury duty. Keith Little, you've been called to jury duty. Jamie Motes, you've been called to jury duty. And I've got to get my other jurors. I'm coming to read name tags. (laughs) Kelly, you've been called to jury duty. Rhonda, you've been called to church. It's a good thing because I was sitting here thinking, you better have some women. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? My mama raised me right. I'm going to tell you that. I guarantee you. I'm smarter than that. I can tell you that. And Tara, you've been called to jury duty. Is that 12? Yes. Ha. Huh. We have all the seats. Residing over this case and the court will be the Honorable Scott Glanton. (laughs) Scott? Yes, sir. Well, I have some help here. Dan, will you move this table? Just cat a corner. Scott, 
Grab your chair, sir. places over the three days. Y'all with this? Keep this in mind. We're still setting the room up. Nextly, I will charge, and actually I won't charge you, but the judge will charge you to select the foreman. Judge? Yes, sir. And we're going to as we've gotten these pieces in place, we're going to start again soon because you've got to make a grand entrance. So, but before we do, I'll give you a few seconds to select a foreman to oversee this jury. Okay. Select or let them select? Well, I love it. I love it. Well, 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 that, that, that is absolutely correct. It needs to be a part of the jury. And you can see that. I, but, you, but, but, you know, the next time you call the judge out like that, sir, you'll be in contempt. <laughs> Keith Litter is our selected foreman. How about that? Well, we're not quite there yet. We're almost there. So we're going to get ready for a litigation battle over the next three days. And so what we need to do is that we need to swear in some witnesses. And so what we're going to do is have the judge simply swear in our witnesses. And our witnesses are you, folks. You're our witnesses to leadership. You're our witnesses against leadership. And we're going to hear a preponderance of evidence that's going to come forth over these three days that either proves that leadership is valued and important in our business, in our professional lives, or in our personal lives, or we're going to find that leadership is probably not what we can use and find useful in being successful, sustainable, and ultimately the premier final expense organization in the world. I argue that leadership is incredibly appropriate and you cannot exist without it. And so what we're going to do is swear in some witnesses. Judge, here's what I'd like for you to do. Yes, Simply put, you're going to ask the, the witnesses here to raise their right hand. Raise your right hand, please. <laughs> and it's as simple as this. You're basically going to tell them, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. And we'll be using here an imaginable Bible, imaginary Bible. So if you see it in front of you, you can see it. So judge, you can proceed. You've been sworn in. Keep in mind, witnesses, that you are on the oath <laughs> this entire trial. So nothing but the truth will suffice. You'll be called upon. You'll be asked questions. You'll be presented with concepts and ideas and thoughts and all the like. And the judge will intervene as we go. And the litigators will also intervene and lead. So here's what we're going to do, and we're going to try and be as official as we possibly can in this capacity. And here we go. We are going to assume that all depositions have taken place. And that's literally your oral testimony. Y'all with that? Your oral story about leadership. 
And so what we've done in my office of more and more and more <laughs> Yeah, we all name more, by the way. Is we've brought all of you in and we've gotten your sworn testimonies. That's what a deposition is. It's your sworn testimony that says you saw what you saw, you witnessed what you witnessed, you know what you know, and along the way, you're going to hear from other litigators, from my defense team, Ted DiBiase Jr., Kevin McGill, y'all with that? Scotty Elliott, and you're going to hear from these other great litigators. And our jury is going to be tasked with a decision. You're going to serve as our witnesses. And so what we want to do is get the trial started. So what we also need is a gavel. Judge, we need a gavel. Yes, so can we find a gavel? Let's find some type of gavel here. We are setting up the courtroom. Do we have something that could give us? No. <laughs> we do have a shoe. Do we have a shoe? Judge, you can pull your shoe off. <laughs> of course, we talked about those odors Mike Jr. talked about earlier. We don't want to <laughs> we'll be careful there. Oh, I love it. I love it. You know, the judge will call this court to order at his leisure. So it's very, very important that we're taking all of our marching orders from the judge. So here we go. Judge, here's what we need. We need you to leave the room. Put your shoe on, that'll help. Oh, that's the gavel. Put the, yeah, it, was, it turns from the shoe to the gavel. So it's back to the shoe, and we can return, it'll turn back to the gavel. There we go. So judge, judge, can you, is that door, can you go out that door and come back in? Can you open it for me if it locks there? It's just a little step there. I would say, or oh, court come to order, and as a result, you will, you will all what? Rise. You will all rise. And so I'm going to say, uh, matter of fact, I'm not going to say it. Let's get us a deputy bailiff that will do it Barney five <laughs> so what we'll do is select our bailiff and who would love to be our bailiff any any volunteers uh, there, there, yeah, oh, come on is that brandon yes. come on brandon boy that's a good looking bailiff right there now <laughs> i guarantee it yes indeed <laughs> bailiff you will stand here in this corner the whole time? No, not, you know, <laughs> you know, Bailiff, this is the one court where you get to have your seat when you've, when you've brought the, the judge in. So, Bailiff, you're simply going to turn and face the jury, me face the, the uh, witnesses and the audience, and you're simply going to say, all rise, and when you say all rise, they're going to come to their feet, and you're going to say, court come to order, the Honorable Judge Scott Glanton. You got some note cards or something? <laughs> <laughs> oh, All right. All right. Court, Court come to order. Court come to order. The Honorable Judge Scott Lanson. Lanson. Yes, sir. <laughs> and, and when he sits, you sit. <laughs> the court has come to order. And judge, for your reference, for your information, this is people versus leadership. And we are ready to hear the case. Okay, so people versus leadership. People versus leadership. And we are ready to hear the case. We are ready to hear the case. Let's proceed. Let's proceed. <laughs> Prosecutor, aha, uh -huh, the prosecuting attorney. In this court, he is not here. He does not exist. 
We are going to win this case. I was waiting on the wise guy that was going to say that too. I was waiting on him. That's awesome. No prosecutor in this case. We will assume he's here, but he doesn't get the microphone. So here we are in courtroom 12D, where we have the case against leadership. And what you're going to hear over these three days is some extraordinary testimony. You're going to hear some extraordinary concepts ideas, thoughts, best practices. You're going to hear the core of leadership and its influence on business and its influence in and on your personal lives. And so in this court, you're going to be asked specific questions. You're going to be interacted with. And we're going to raise discussions to the subject matters. So we're going to proceed with the case. We've got our foreman. Foreman, where's our foreman? There he is, Keith. You're going to oversee the jury. That will be a time when you're going to leave the court three days from now, and you're going to come back with a decision. Okay? There is such a thing as a what kind of jury? Oh, no. A hung jury. Make sure all these rascals vote yes. <laughs> so we get the idea here, okay? We're in a courtroom. And we're going to get ready to have this case. And so what I'd like to do, you may see on your form there, on your itinerary, um, the description of my talk. And actually, that's a typo. And really, that's one of the points of the opening discussions or the opening litigation to the case, OK? And so what I'd like to do is start with uh, my opening defense. Are you all with that? I'm going to start with my opening defense. And so I'm going to present to you really three arguments, three arguments, and the rest of my defense team, our co-counsel, will also come forward with evidence after me and tomorrow and Wednesday, OK? Because I truly want you to really understand why we're at a leadership summit and to get a really good picture of the concept and the idea of leadership. And we truly do want to find leadership to be of value or not, OK? Because I truly do believe that it has incredible value. And you can't go anywhere, do anything, and really become anything without uh, appropriate and proper, effective, efficient leadership. And so I'm going to start the case. And here's what I like to do. I'm going to bring forward some thoughts, some ideas, some concepts that I'm not here to tell you to agree with. I'm not here to tell you what I'm going to tell you in a few moments, jury, that I automatically want you to agree with. Now, my council friends over here, imaginary, is going to try and bring you some things that is going to try and dispel what we're going to talk about for these three days. And they'll woo do die you to death with all of their magical tricks and all of their little edits and thoughts. And, but they'll have no evidence. They'll have no anything that can clearly communicate that leadership is inappropriate in today's marketplace, in today's workforce, in your very careers, and final expense as managers and leaders. And so what you're going to hear is absolute, accurate, concrete evidence that leadership has a high premium on it. And if there's anybody that understands premiums, I would imagine it's this group. Am I right? <laughs> you understand premiums. And so as a result, I'm going to start my defense of leadership. And I really believe it really doesn't need any defending, but it's appropriate for this setting. And so witnesses, you're going to be brought forth and jury, you're going to hear from witnesses, OK, that's going to testify of their experiences with leadership. And they're going to come as a part of our defense team to support what we believe to be accurate and true when it comes to leadership. 
And I want to make sure that as you hear from our cross-examiners, our friends here to the left, once again, we believe we're going to prove our case. We're going to prove that it was right for you to sign up for a leadership conference. It was beneficial for you to be here so that you can hear testimony and you can experience a situation that will absolutely change your life. We're going to present this case to the jury. First of all, I'm going to provide you with, and, and this is interesting, I'm going to present to you three arguments to start the case. Three simple arguments. Are you ready for them? Three arguments. My co-counsel is going to come this afternoon, Tuesday and Wednesday, and they're going to further present more evidence that's going to be mounting that what we need not only in business, not only in our country, but in our families also, is great leadership. Because without it, everything crumbles. So here we are. We've got three, three arguments I want to present. And again, jury, I really want you to listen in closely to the argument. Because when you go back to your deliberation room, you're going to have some things to ponder. Did the defense present a well enough case to support evidentially the case for leadership? Or did the prosecution refute that evidence and prove its case? And the three arguments. First, I want to submit to you the first argument for leadership. The first argument for leadership. And I want to define it as the power of leadership. The power of leadership. The first argument is this. It can be argued that there are a lot of characteristics of leadership that are apropos and that are important. And we could name a lot of them. There are a lot of characteristics, traits, qualities of leadership that we can line up and say, that is a great characteristic of leadership. That is a great model for leadership. We heard a gentleman come up earlier and talk about biblical leadership and using the characters of God and Christ. And I am from the old school of biblical thinking as well, and I believe in that deeply. But I want to submit to you argument number one, jury. And I want to present to this court the first preponderance of evidence that I bring to the table to support, judge, our case for leadership is that the number one characteristic of leadership is influence. The number one characteristic of leadership is influence. Well, you may or may not agree with that, but I want to prove to you and share with you why I think influence is the number one characteristic of leadership among all of its traits and characteristics. That influence is. Because you see, what causes a person to follow you or not is your influence or lack thereof on that individual. What motivates that individual is your lack of or your effort to influence someone from a perspective that gets them to perform at their highest level, to perform at their maximum levels. And so your ability to influence people is a powerful tool in getting results. Because if you don't have influence, you don't have anything. 
your ability to influence other people. And so it comes down to whether or not you're an influencer or not. Are you an influencer as a leader? Or are you lacking influence and you can't get your people to do what you need them to do? You can't get the results you're looking for. You've not, you don't quite know the buttons to push. And as a result, your influence is lacking. Influence is everything. I make a case for family. I believe mothers and fathers are great influences on children. I believe when a mother and a father are absent, I believe there is a powerful influence on a child that's missing. I believe that the concentrated influence of a mother when it comes to nurturing a child, there's nothing second to it. I believe for a young man that the influence of another male in his life, there's nothing second to it. I believe that influence is so powerful that it can get people to perform at a level they never thought they could. All because of the influencer, the respect you have for the influencer, and the influencer's ability to have proven through a track record that they can get the results that they're talking about. Influence. Witness number one. I'm gonna call on a witness. Let me let me say. Listen, uh, I will add to that because here are the sub traits of influence, Judge. Uh, you know, for the influencer that is required to be a captivating leader. You talked about feelings, emotion. You have to feel that, and then they get a sense of your influence, and they you don't have to drag them down the road. They willingly come. They willingly come. And I want to give you three things that causes the customer uh, to willingly come. Here it is, because of the influencer. And I call it this. Integrity, care, and an example. We use the acronym, you got to ice them. I-C-E. Well, it sounds like this influence play a, plays a major role, Judge, uh, jury in this whole landscape of leadership. That if you want to lead, if you are a leader, then you are also an influencer. And if you are calling yourself a leader and you're not an influencer, not only with your customers, but also with your team, then there needs to be some stepping back and further examination of one's leadership skill sets. Well, the second argument I want to make is to position of leadership. I'm going to go quicker here. And the question beckons, is it more effective to lead from the front or from the rear? Interesting debate. Interesting debate. And so what I would like to present in point number two is what is leading from the front and what is leading from the rear. And I am prescribing to judge, jury, that leading from the front is apropos. It is, it has its incredible merit, it does, when one leads from the front. Literally speaking, you get the idea that you know where you're going. <clears throat> and you also are subscribing to the idea that the people behind you or those that are following you are truly there. But I also want to subscribe to the idea that when you're leading from the front, obviously there is great merit to that. But the only problem with that is that you can't see what's behind you. Here's the deal, because someone once said, wow, is that good? Someone once said that if you're leading and you look behind you and no one's following you, you're just taking a walk. <laughs> That's all you're doing. And so it's so important 
that yes, you lead from the front, you can lead from the front, but there has to be an incredible amount of influence and work and demonstration of integrity, care, okay, that has to lead so that those that are behind you are truly following and you're not just taking a walk. Otherwise, you get this. You find yourself like a parent does. The mom is in the passenger seat or driving. The dad's in the passenger seat or driving. And the kids are in the back seat. And you're in front and you're taking the kids to Disney. And we're all excited about going to Disney. And in the back seat, the kids are fighting. <laughs> and the parents are always, stop it, Joe, stop that. You stop Got to pull the car on the side of the road. Et cetera, et cetera. And it's amazing the kids will do that and they're kids and they'll do those kinds of things. But what's interesting is that when you pull the car over and the dad gets in the back seat with the kids, all of a sudden the gyrate stops. Why? Because the dad can see what's going on or they've stopped doing whatever it was they were doing because now I have a rear view seat and no one can get away with anything. Because when you're in the front solely, you can't really trust, <coughs> unless they are people of great integrity, you really can't trust who did what or didn't do what. And so there is some argument for what we call rehab if you're leading from the front. When you lead from the front, one of the things you find yourself doing a lot is going back and making corrections. You find yourself going back and rehabbing. And I'm telling you this, when you're spending all of your time in business rehabbing people, you're losing business. Are you with that? When you spend all of your time fixing problems, you're going to find yourself not being profitable. When you find yourself always making corrections, you're spending more time rehabbing opposed to prehabbing. And prehabbing has a lot to do with following from the rear. Because when you're rehabbing people, you realize in this nation how much money is put into rehabbing people. The rehabilitation business is a billion dollar business. So if you're going to lead from the front, there is an argument that does say it is apropos and it is great. But you're going to have to do a wonderful job of setting an example, leading with integrity, demonstrating that you care, so that you're not just taking a walk, and ultimately you've got people following you, and you don't have to have eyes in the what? Because if you don't have integrity, and if you don't care, and you're not an example as a leader, because here's the deal, you know, if you're telling me to do it and you're not doing it, what happens? Say again? Well, I don't have to do it. I don't have to do it. So if you want to lead and not have to put eyes in the back of your head, I would subscribe to this court, judge, jury, that leading from the front is apropos. And it's effective. And it yields results. And it does produce. And it will make you profitable. But your people must what? What? Wow. Your people must follow. And the way you get them to follow has everything to do with the influencer. Well, or is it more appropriate to follow or to lead from the rear? I believe leading from the rear has an apropos point because here's the deal. You spend less time rehabbing and more time prehabbing. Can't you see that? Here's the deal. 
if I'm following from the, if I'm leading from the rear, I can see what? Everything. Everybody, everything. I can address issues even before they what? I can see them and anticipate them because I have a vision and an ability to identify, make corrections, take care of errors, far in advance so that we can be sustainable, profitable, and we can be the company and the business we want to be because we're spending no money rehabbing people and we're preserving our income and now we're reinvesting it in other places in the company and getting a greater return all because we're no longer rehabbing people, we're prehabbing people, we're no longer just leading from the front, but we're leading from the rear, we're no longer having to look behind us to see what's going on because you know what we've got character integrity examples going forward and those people are willing to follow that or we're leading from the rear and we can see everybody and maintain our capital because we're not spending any money rehabbing people because we're prehabbing people well court I argue with you And I'm going to ask a couple of witnesses here. Very good. Very good. Uh, you know, again, we're, we're going to continue to bring forth evidence uh, that would uh, make a case for leadership. And jury, I, I certainly, you've heard uh, eyewitnesses here this, this afternoon. Uh, and, and I want to bring just one more witness. I've got three minutes uh, before I take my seat. And, and my uh, counsel uh, uh, over here will, will take the, take the, uh, the stance, will take the, the front and present their case. But before I take my seat, there's just one more uh, piece of evidence. Before I, I close, I want to call one more, two, or two more witnesses to the stand before I take my seat for the afternoon. And I do want to give you that third and final argument to help me with that uh, and I call it the pen or pencil of leadership the pen or pencil of leadership and what I have found based on what eyewitnesses have told me judge what the local sheriff department came back to me with after going from home to home, after these eyewitnesses knocked on door to door, they took their leads and they went into these communities and they knocked on these doors. They made appointments. They had their applications. They walked the client through the process. from even expert witnesses. I've been told that in the insurance business that there are some things that need to be written in pen and there are other things that need to be written in pencil. Can I get an eyewitness on that? Mr. Murray, again, jury, we're, we're talking about, you know, teaching uh, new agents. We're, we're talking about uh, influence. And, and Mr. Murray, would, I, I would say jury, is an expert witness. Mr. Murray, how long have you been in the business? 45. <laughs> <laughs> I think that would classify him as an expert witness. You know, you've seen it all, have you, have you not? Well, as you can see, I, we brought forth an expert witness uh, to make a case for leadership. How, how is that? Uh, let's, let's see. I, I, just one more witness. Uh, wow. Mr. Scotty Elliott. I, I'm, 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 it's my last expert witness, Judge, and, and I know you want me to take my seat. I know you do. and I, I, I can see it. And, uh, and I'm going to. I, I know you want to recess this court and, and, and adjourn and get back to tomorrow, right? I'm a sort of a long witness, long witness, uh, oh, got the gavel out. Let me, let me, let me get to it. Uh, Mr. Scotty Elliott, uh, I brought you to the stand today to uh, uh, really communicate for us in closing all three of those arguments. 
as best you've heard them, as uh, we've brought forth expert witnesses, eyewitnesses, experienced witnesses, uh, because what I, I really believe this jury needs to hear, because they've got to go back and they've got to go to a deliberation room, and I'm going to tell you what, they can't leave until somebody, they get everybody on the same page. And so what we're doing as a defense team is making a case for leadership because these guys over here are going to come with their case to refute my witnesses and going to try and change this jury's mind. And so before I take my seat today, Judge, yes, I want to bring my last expert witness to give me just a summary of what we talked about for the case for leadership and the arguments we presented. So Mr. Scotty Elliott, would you please come forward and give us our closing summary as we build this case for leadership so this jury can make an intelligent and informed decision. You got to be on your P's and Q's with Derek around, boy. I'll tell you what. You call on me swift, fast, and in a hurry. All they know is going to be like that. Dude. Everybody likes to see y'all attentive in your seat. No, I think, first off, I would suggest to you that you've done a tremendous job of articulating and substantiating the case for leadership. And I would concur with everything that was alluded to in the room today. Um, what I hope that it's done in our first opening case is have us take self inventory. Because that's what this is all about. You know, I hope that we've taken some self-examination. And the essential question that comes to mind for me is who am I influencing? And so, you know, in terms of a closing uh, thought, if you will, I, I would ask that each one of you pose that question to yourself. And I wouldn't handcuff it to just the professional realm. Because again, again, I think it's important that we consider in all facets of our life. Who are you influencing? And what does that look like? I love that, uh, I, I love um, that acronym, I guess it would be ISOM. You know, integrity and care and example. You know, as I think of myself as a father and as a husband, you know, I hope that I'm the embodiment of that acronym. And, uh, and, then, and then in my post, you know, as president of One Life America, you know, that's everything. If I'm not nailing down the ice, on, or the ice, rather, uh, then we're in trouble. You know, we're going to be melting quickly. Mm. You know? but, it, but, you know, in, in regards to leadership, I mean, without leadership, none of us would be here. One Life wouldn't be here. And I think that we've done a tremendous job of, uh, you know, communicating that case. And the other thing I thought that was... Uh, really quite interesting was this idea of prehab versus rehab. That was quite thought-provoking. I've not heard that one before. Um, and so I, I think with it, you know, it's, it's stimulated my thought on the prehab piece of it. You know, one of the things that I hope that we do as an organization, and that filters through the rank, so to speak, is on this prehab piece. I think what I've, what I've noticed in my short tenure in the industry is there's this great fear of just being transparent with people and being honest. You know, and there's all this posturing that goes on in the sales ranks. I see it every day, you know, of uh, trying to posture ourselves to be something that we're not for fear of that recruit might not go with us, you know, versus just being transparent, open, and honest about what we do. We know that we earn a piece off you. This is the value proposition. And I'd rather convey expectations truly and honestly on the front end. And there's your prehab piece. Yes. You know, wow. <laughs> that's a big piece of the prehab. And then you're not revisiting things on down the road. Well, well, that's not really what I thought it was supposed to be. I cannot stand that, you know, when I hear that. Because that tells me I did an ineffective job of conveying expectations and informing that person. You know, uh, there should be no unmet expectations. We should be following through. But doing a good job of communicating on the front end and, uh, and knowing what you're about and where you're drawing the proverbial line in the sand and who you're trying to attract. Because a winning culture will attract winning people. And people that aren't aligned with our cultural culture, you don't have to terminate anybody. They'll they'll get gone. Mm. You know, um, and and a, and I hate to belabor the scriptural references, but one comes readily to mind. And let me put this disclaimer too, because I know we've hit a lot on uh, religion in here on the front end. Um, and I've said this often. You know, you do not have to be a Christian to work with One Life. That is not a prerequisite. That is not a mandate. Um, you know, we're going to be true to who we are and be unapologetic in our approach. 
Uh, and I think it makes us a better company because we know who we serve. Uh, but you do not have to be a believer or a Christian to be a one life. In fact, I get excited when people of different faiths and diversity come here in hopes that maybe they'll see something different about how we operate in business and provide us a testimony. But this uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2 comes readily to mind, particularly so Romans 12, 2. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you begin, may begin to approve and test out the good and perfect will. And um, where was I going with that on the prehab? Or the culture, rather. You know, um, you know, the world tries to squeeze us into the world's mold, you know, and, uh, and so, you know, to not be conformed by that. And the culture that we project, you know, I think people will either be attracted to it or they won't be. Or they'll get in and they'll be uncomfortable quickly if they're not icing it, and then they'll be out of it. And, and those are the people we don't want to be in business with anyway, because we're never going to build anything sustainable. And all that goes back to influence. Mm. Um, wow. So I, I think that the, the case was well laid out on the front end. I'm ecstatic to see what our other presenters have to say on that front. And, um, and so with that, thank I'm you. Go. That's wow. what you're looking for. <laughs> thank you, sir. What, a, what another expert witness. And what we're going to do, uh, Judge, I'm going to take my seat and turn it over to you. Where's our bailiff? Our bailiff needs to come forward. And because uh, what we're going to do this proper. So tomorrow, I won't, have to, I won't lead in any of this. The judge is going to take over, and I'm just going to come as a defense team. And as I introduce my co-counsel uh, on the rest of the afternoon and tomorrow, remember, we're going to take our same seats uh, each day when we come in, if that's OK, if everybody can be comfortable with that, and, and build this case uh, by Wednesday. And we're going to hope to get to a verdict is what we're going to hope to get to. So what we're going to do first, Judge, we're going to let you dismiss the jury. I know we're going on a 15-minute break. He's going to, in, in our world, but in the courtroom world, uh, we're going to dismiss the jury as they head back to the deliberation room. And then once the jury is dismissed, the bailiff is going to say, all rise. You know, court is adjourned. OK. And so you'll be dismissed. Yes, sir. And, uh, uh, and the judge will leave first. When the judge leaves, then, of course, you can leave next. <laughs> Uh, and that goes to the bailiff first. So first of all, no judge needs to dismiss the jury. Hurry up, judge. I gotta go to the back. Hey, Derek. Uh oh, we got a jury talking. Can we do this for dinner too? Can we play this? <laughs> Absolutely. 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 <laughs> Or something like that. Um, <laughs> Gers, you may be dismissed.